Welcome everyone to the webinar of uh, Natural uh, Food Ingredients Export Openings uh, to Europe. Um, very nice of you all, all to be here. Um, today um, I will start with uh, some information, a short introduction about CBI. Uh, what does CBI does and how, how can you benefit from what uh, CBI offers and, and especially on the market information. And then I will give the floor to uh, Amarjit Sahota of Ecovia Intelligence, who will uh, tell you more about the uh, the, the current market, so uh, and uh, the growing demand of natural ingredients for food. And I will talk about on some trends and expert openings uh, in Europe. Uh, so we'll start with CBI. Uh, the mission of CBI is that we connect the SMEs in developing countries to the European markets uh, and contribute to a sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Uh, with this mission, we uh, work on uh, sustainable development goal number eight of the United Nations, which is decent work and economic growth. Uh, we are uh, our current target countries, so that's are the countries we are uh, we can start projects in. We, d we do not have projects in all these countries yet, but we can start projects in these countries. These are our target countries. So it's uh, currently uh, mostly Africa and uh, Middle East and some in Asia. And uh, yeah, Latin America is, is getting less, but we'll still ha have some projects there. Our focus sectors, uh, we have 14 focus sectors at the moment, uh, the sectors we're active in as CBI. And, and three of these sectors are for natural ingredients, which is the natural ingredients uh, for cosmetics, natural ingredients for health products, and natural food additives, or natural food ingredients. So that's why we're here for today. Today is about natural food uh, ingredients. And so we zoom into that. Uh, our target groups of CBI for our, our projects and our market intelligence are uh, mostly the exporters uh, from developing countries, from our target countries, uh, to uh, who are, have the ability and the ambition to export uh, to Europe. And uh, we also uh, are in close contact with the business service organizations in, in the countries we have projects in and the policy makers. Uh, with them we work on an uh, export enabling environment and we stay in contact with importers in Europe which are of course uh, very important to have uh, matchmaking with our exporters. Uh, the core competence of CBI are company coaching uh, then the companies in our programs, we coach them to, to get uh, to get ready for export. We give them a lot of trainings for that. And we work with the business service organizations on an export enabling environment. We organize missions for the European market entry. So for instance, uh, we visit trade fairs together. And in, in, this, uh, in this time period, we organize the digital uh, matchmaking sessions. And uh, last but not least, we offer a lot of market intelligence. Uh, so that's what you're here for today. The, I will show you some more about uh, where you can find uh, market intelligence of CBI. We provide uh, studies for market analysis and market entry. The market analysis study are studies of what's the demand in Europe uh, within the sector and which trends offer opportunities within the sector. And we offer market entry studies, which are about buy requirements. Uh, what, what, what requirements uh, does your products have to comply with in, for Europe? And we give tips for finding buyers in Europe and tips for doing business with European buyers. And we have a study on tips uh, for organizing your export. And besides that, we offer a lot of uh, product fact sheets on the most promising expert products. So that's I, all this information combined but then for one product. 
and so well, let's let's look some more at, at our website if you go to the cbi.eu slash market information you will uh, see our our sectors we're active in we have studies in uh, you can click on natural food additives for example and then you come at the, on the page for natural food additives and uh, you see the studies we offer this is the studies we just talked about tip studies uh, demand and trends and uh, we have news news items here and these are the promising expert product products we have so the specific products we offer information on if we click on what's the demand you come in the study what's the demand and you can read it uh, on your uh, on your screen by scrolling down or you can download the research so that's where you can find uh, all the information please visit our website i'm going to give the floor now uh, to uh, armajit who will start the presentation about uh, the natural food additive sector thank you Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, good afternoon to those in Asia and, uh, and Africa. Um, we're just trying to change the screen. There we go. Okay, so. So what I want to do this, over the next half an hour is I want to give you an update on the use of natural food ingredients in Europe. And I want to highlight their export openings, looking at our audience most of you are from Asia and from Africa, although we do have. It's muted. Oh, thanks. Okay, so can can everyone hear me? I've just got a message that uh, you could not hear. So what I want to do is to talk about the export openings for natural food ingredients in Europe, and uh, I've got. A half an hour presentation and please keep some questions okay. okay apparently we're having some problems with the microphone um, can you send a message can you hear this voice was better okay oh, i can hear perfect perfect so you can hear okay we'll speak a bit louder so so what i want to do is i want to talk about export openings for natural food ingredients in europe bearing in mind that uh, most of the audience is going to be in africa and in latin america okay we have a microphone so i'm going to bring that closer now, a brief introduction to what we do. Uh, our company has been around for 20 years. We were initially formed as Organic Monitor. We changed our name in spring 2017 to better represent the range of services we provide. So we do market and technical research, business and sustainability consulting, seminars and workshops, and uh, we also do sustainability summits in Europe, North America, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. Uh, just to highlight the events that we do in this area, since 2009, we've been doing the Sustainable Food Summit. And because uh, of the COVID pandemic, we've moved these events online. Our next one is going to be in North America, 25th to 28th of January. And then we've got auditions in Europe, in Asia Pacific, and Latin America uh, next year. Now, what I want to do here is talk about some of the macro trends. What's really causing demand for natural food ingredients in Europe? The first factor is we have an aging population. I'm going to cover that a little bit later. We've got co consumer concerns about contentious ingredients, things like synthetic additives, synthetic colors, additives, uh, preservatives, etc. And then there's a rise in vegans and vegetarianism and then ethical sourcing and labeling schemes are increasing. So these are some of the macro trends that we see in Europe, which are affecting demand for natural food ingredients. 
talking about an aging population, if you look at the demographics of Europe, and this is a chart of the sections of the population from 2001, uh, projected all the way up until 2050. So it's a bit small there, you can't see it, but on the right hand side is 2050. And the blue part is the percentage of the population which is um, under 55. So the percentage of the population has gone from 25%, uh, sorry, it's gone from um, 25%, which is over 55, and that's going to be reaching, so just to repeat again, the blue part is the age which is under 55, and the red and the other shades of yellow are over 55, 65, 75, etc. So the percentage of the population which is under 55 is going to go from 75% all the way to 55% over the next few years. So this is having a big impact on this market because as European consumers are getting older, they want to have more and more health and wellness products and that's demanding, that's creating demand for natural food ingredients. Now, when you talk about health and wellness in the food industry, one of the biggest sectors is really organic foods. And I want to talk about some of the trends happening in the organic food market and to talk about how consumers are buying these products and what they're really looking for. The European market for organic food and drink was worth 45 billion US dollars in 2018. It's growing by about 7% per year. And the key factors there are the market is quite heterogeneous. You've got 28, 29 countries in Western Europe or part of the European Union. The market is really concentrated in Western Europe. So it's in the countries which are in the Western part, not so much the Southern part of Europe, not so much Central Eastern European part. And another factor there is production of organic foods is increasing across the board, so across Europe. What are the major drivers? What's causing demand for organic foods to go up? So one of the big drivers is consumer concerns about pesticides and agrochemicals. Consumers are really uh, concerned about synthetic pesticides, about, um, about uh, synthetic uh, herbicides, growth promoters, agrochemicals, etc. We're seeing distribution increase so distribution is increasing in retail outlets like supermarkets, hypermarkets, department stores. And then another factor is retailer private labels. Private labels are having a very big impact on this market. And almost all big food retailers now in Europe are selling organic foods under their private labels. We're also seeing demand from the catering and food service sector. That's the um, catering food service uh, outlets we're more and more using organic ingredients. Talking about private labels, I'm just giving you a few examples over here. We've got uh, Auchan on the left hand side, a French hypermarket chain. They're selling over 100 organic products for less than one euro. On the right hand side, you have Albert Heijn in Netherlands, and they're selling over 1,000 organic products under the private label. On the bottom right hand side, you've got Coop Switzerland. They're selling, um, they're selling over 1,300 organic products, and their private label products uh, represent over half of all the organic food sales in Switzerland. And here in the UK, you've got Tesco Organic. They've got eight, over 800 organic products. So I talked about catering and food service. Just to talk a little bit more about this, you've got a large number of outlets in Europe which are using organic ingredients. And the front runner here really is France, where you've got over half of all the different food service outlets that are using organic ingredients. And still sticking to France, I have a picture of the Bio Burger, and that's an organic burger sold in the quality fast food chain in uh, France. Also in Europe, in McDonald's in the UK, Sweden, and in uh, Germany, they're using organic milk. IKEA and Protein Moshe, they're using organic ingredients uh, for their outlets as well. 
Let's talk briefly about consumer behavior. So why are consumers buying organic products? This is a study by the OCO Barometer in 2019. And they found that the biggest driver of organic food sales in Germany was animal welfare, 95%. And then it was regional origin, 93%. And then it was about social standards, fair wages, 92%. So it's not really about pesticides anymore. It's not really about the agrochemicals. It tends to be other ethical issues which are driving demand in Germany. France, which has the second biggest market in Europe, the biggest driver of organic food sales here is personal health, 63%. And then it's environmental impact, 58%. So there is quite a bit of variation uh, in terms of uh, why consumers are buying organic products from country to country. Originally, it was because they want to avoid synthetic pesticides and chemicals, but now it appears to be a lot wider factors than, than that. Now, what I want to do here is I want to show you a study which was done by Kantar World, World Panel last year. And uh, this was a global study in which they ask consumers which are the green issues that are most important to them. So what they first found was that consumers are a lot more conscious than they've ever been before. They're a lot more conscious of green issues. But the number one factor that they're most concerned about, 17% on the top there, is climate change. Number two is plastic waste, 14%. And then it's water pollution, 11%. So there's, there's a bit of a difference there between why consumers are buying organic foods and the green issues which are most important to them. Climate change and plastic waste appear to be far more important than their pesticides and chemicals in their food. Now, the number two issue which consumers are most concerned about in the world is plastic waste. And um, to, put, to give some context over here, uh, packaging represents about one third of all household waste here in Europe. And plastics represents about a quarter of that. And what we're seeing here in Europe, consumers are more and more uh, concerned about plastics, how they use food and how they use for consumer goods. And here in the EU, there's going to be a ban on certain types of single use plastics from next year. So this is a very big issue here in Europe in terms of plastics. And because of that, we're seeing this very big trend where more and more organic food companies or more and more natural food companies are moving to plastic-free products. So over here on the top right-hand side, we have an example of the Dutch trader, Joster, and um, they're the biggest trader of organic fruit and vegetables in Europe. And they moved to laser branding for the organic fruit and vegetables in 2018 they received the Sustainable uh, Packaging Award for that initiative because they've saved 6.3 million pieces of plastics in the first year. And on the bottom there, I've got some examples of their products, how they're using laser branding, which is totally safe and can be washed off uh, as opposed to using plastic packaging. On the left-hand side, I have an example of the organic food retailer EcoPlaza. They made the news in 2018 because they were the first retailer in the world to have plastic-free aisles in their stores. So they're selling products in their stores, certain parts of the stores, with no plastics at all. The next big trend I want to talk about is there's a very big shift away from animal proteins. And one of the reasons for that is this picture over here. So this is a, a chart courtesy of Green Monday from Hong Kong. And um, they did a study, they commissioned a study showing that worldwide there's 1.5 billion cows and they produce 5.5 billion tons of, of a carbon dioxide. And that's more carbon emissions than, um, than the, these countries combined. So we've got uh, 10 countries, which is of Canada, Brazil, Australia, UK, Spain, etc. They produce 5.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide, but the cows on the planet are producing far more greenhouse gases. 
Now, as consumers become more and more aware of these issues, they want to have a diet which is having less animal products. And because of that, we're seeing a big rise in vegetarianism and veganism in Europe. So I've got a chart here which shows you the number of vegetarians in Europe. Um, the highest number is in Italy, which is roughly 10% of the population. Then is Germany and Switzerland, about 9% of the population. And the bottom chart there is the number of new uh, product launches which are vegan. And that's really increasing exponentially. So this is a very big trend in Europe where, where we're seeing a rising number of vegans, vegetarians, and flexitarians, whereby consumers are having less animal protein in their diet. Um, and because of that, we're seeing this big trend over here of plant-based foods. Originally, over 10 years ago, they were sold as dairy-free products, meat-free products, and they were sold as substitutes for milk, or for yogurts, and for meats. But now, they're becoming a standalone category, and the product taste and the uh, product, product taste and the feel of these products is almost identical to the animal products, like egg, like milk, a cheese, etc. And I've given some examples over here where products look almost identical, like the animal-based products. Now, I want to highlight some of the major ingredient trends or the ingredients which are gaining popularity in Europe. So plant-based proteins, I've talked about this already. Uh, we've got palm oil alternatives. Palm oil is linked to, south, to deforestation in Southeast Asia. Then you've got natural sweeteners. Um, there's a big move to move away from sugar because of health issues and natural sweeteners are gaining popularity. Seaweed is gaining popularity as an ingredient to be used in food products. And then you've got certified ingredients like organic, and fair trade, rainforest alliance. So these trends create an opportunity for exporters in developing countries. I just want to give a couple of examples from uh, work we've done for CBI. Uh, this chart shows imports of stevia, which is a natural sweetener, and other alternative sweeteners into Europe. And the volumes is the blue bar, whereby the green line is the value. And as you can see, over that five-year period, uh, the volumes have been increasing, as well as the revenue value. So this shows you imports of stevia and other alternative sweeteners from developing countries is, is increasing. Sticking with sweeteners, this chart shows imports of alternative sugars, including coconut sugar, into the European Union. And now you've got the blue bar at the bottom, bottom which represents volumes, and the green line, which represents revenues. And this, again, shows the trend is the same. More and more imports of coconut sugar and related products are coming into Europe. So these statistics show that alternative sweeteners imports are increasing from developing countries, and that means there's an opportunity there for you to supply these products. In the second part of this presentation, I want to give you some future projections and highlight the business openings uh, for producers in developing countries. So the first thing, what everyone's talking about this year, 2020 is going to be the year of the coronavirus, and uh, this is really having a big impact on natural food ingredients and as well as natural food products. Let's talk about how it's affecting the supply of natural food ingredients first. First, what we're seeing is there's been a lot of disruption in the supply of natural food ingredients because of lockdowns and emergency measures introduced by various governments. So there's been disruption in the flow of these ingredients coming into Europe. And we're also seeing shortages, especially during the spring and the summer months, there were shortages of ingredients because of uh, freight delays, uh, longer transportation costs, and also because of the lockdown as well. And what, what we're seeing as a result of that is companies, raw material importers, they're now looking at setting up local supply chains as opposed to sourcing from different parts of the world. Now they're looking to source locally, if not regionally, uh, for their raw materials. 
looking at the impact it's had on the market and consumers. So if you go from the left hand side, what we saw during the peak of the crisis or just before the crisis started, there was a surge of demand from food retailers as non-essential shops closed down, because consumers started doing stockpiling and there was a very high demand for natural food products. And on the other hand, a lot of uh, cafes, restaurants, hotels were closed. So there was a collapse in demand from the catering and food service sector. And then we've seen a big rise in online retailing. We've seen, uh, one, well, you can say the biggest winner during this crisis has really been online retailing. We've seen more and more consumers who never shopped online before, now going to Amazon, now going to online retailers and buying their products that way. On the right hand side, if you look at consumers, what we've seen is consumer demand for health and wellness products has increased since the crisis. Demand for organic foods, natural products has, all, has increased because consumers are more concerned about personal immunity. However, the long term implications we're not sure because uh, unemployment rates are increasing. We're heading for the worst economic recession, they say, for 100 years. So we're not sure how much that's going to sustain in the coming months or in the coming years um, as consumers lose their jobs, as they become more cautious about where they spend their money, and maybe we're not going to see a sustained uh, trend in terms of purchases of organic and natural products. And the last factor there is consumers, they're really changing the way that they're buying these products and how they're consuming these products. Um, I've talked about online retailing, but consumers are going less frequently to shops now, but they're buying more per visit, and they tend to be buying more health products, uh, as I've said before. The next trend, I want to talk about sustainability schemes. This is a very big trend in the food industry, and what we've seen in the last um, five to 10 years is more and more schemes being introduced to single ingredients. You're already aware of RSPO for sustainable palm oil. You've got sustainable sugar schemes for corn sucro. Then you've got two schemes there for sustainable soya, Proterra Foundation, and then you've got the round table of uh, responsible soya. And a new initiative there, SRP, is for sustainable rice. That was introduced in 2015, and that's backed by the United Nations. So what we're seeing is more and more certification schemes for single ingredients, and that's part of a wider trend where we're seeing more and more ethical labels and sustainability schemes in the food industry. Today, you've got over 200 different labels which represent some ethical, environmental, or social aspects in the food industry. Now, the question is, how important are those labels? Uh, this is a study done by the European Union a couple of years ago. And uh, what they did was they polled consumers in the European Union countries to ask them how important are they in terms of their purchasing decisions. Overall, at the European level, 32% of respondents said they are important when they're buying products. And the highest level, which is on the right hand side, is for Sweden and then it's for Denmark. It's 70% in Sweden, 58% in Denmark. The lowest is actually in Portugal, 58%, where consumers said it does not affect their decision at all. So it's clear that ethical labels or sustainability schemes play an important role in Europe. But the question there for you is, which schemes should you adopt and will they really help you in terms of market entry? So to close, what are the market openings? Just to summarize some of the points I've talked about today already, um, Europe has a highly prospective market for natural food ingredients. As I've shown you, it has the second largest organic food market in the world. It has a very large food processing sector, so there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, you need to follow the ingredient trends, like I've highlighted. If you really want to capitalize on this market, you need to follow the trends to understand what's in demand and what's not. And one of the big issues is really about finding a suitable distribution partner. 
Um, that's something that you can actually do a webinar by itself. And that's something that we're looking to do as a follow-up webinar to this with the CBI to talk about market entry and distribution. You should be aware of COVID-19 impacts. It's affecting the way that these ingredients are sourced, the way that they're distributed, the way that they're used, and also at the consumer level, as I've shown you. You should be aware of what's happening to the UK. If you're looking to access the UK market, the UK will officially, well, the UK is officially left the European Union, and the transition period is going to be ending in December of this year. And there's a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen from January 2021. So for those of you who are looking to access the UK market, you're going to have to look at that separately from the European Union. And the last point I want to talk about is think about innovation. Because um, if you're going to be successful in this market, it's not just going to be about supplying uh, shea butter, supplying um, coconut sugar, or a palm oil alternative, you really need to think about doing something different or something novel. And I want to close by giving you some examples of that. One of the big trends, as I've said earlier, is plant-based foods. And this is an example of a Dutch company called Fairtrade Original. They're sourcing jackfruit in Thailand, and uh, they launched the first canned jackfruit in Europe last year and uh, they're marketing it as a meat alternative whereby you can use it as a replacement for chicken, pork, or cooking. And that product has been very successful. Again, it's sourced from a developing country. It's marketed as ethical and as a plant-based protein. And uh, that product has done very well, not just in Netherlands, but in Europe. Second example I want to give is this company called Ibis Rice. And um, it's a Cambodian company. They're sourcing organic, wildlife-friendly rice from Cambodia. And uh, there's a picture there of an award that they received for new sustainable product last year for this initiative. What they're doing is they're working directly with farmers to protect 50,000 hectares of land area to protect endangered species like the ibis bird. And uh, this initiative is making the uh, is creating demand for their product because it's new, it's ethical, and, it, and it's also protecting wildlife. Next example I want to give is this company called ForestWise. And what we're seeing is more and more products like these are being introduced. And what they're doing is they're working with indigenous communities in Borneo, Indonesia, to produce rainforest ingredients like elite butter, coconut sugar, and forest sugar. And what they're doing is they're working with the local communities, so they're protecting the rainforest and they're, pre they're preventing for the rainforest to be destroyed for palm oil or for other plantations. So they're creating a market or local economy so that the, lo so the local communities can pick these products uh, while harvested, they process them, and they're selling them here in Europe. And the last example I want to talk about is the Dutch company Seymour, which launched the first seaweed-based pasta in 2016. And I'll put examples there on the right-hand side. Other companies like Clearspring are producing seaweed snacks. Now, some of these seaweeds are sourced from Asia, again, highlighting the business openings. So the examples I've given are of innovation. They're raw materials coming from developing countries, but they're not just sold as simple ingredients, they're sold as value-added ingredients because they've got a high nutrient quantity or the nutrient quality, or they've got uh, some ethical aspects. And with that, I'm going to close. Um, I see there's quite a lot of questions on the right-hand side. Um, the copy of this presentation will be made, will be made available by CBI.